This is a bird feeder, and everything to my left is my attempt at making it squirrel proof. If they want the bird seed, they will first need to pass through what is basically an eight part Ninja Warrior obstacle course for squirrels. This course is extremely challenging. It is not for the timid of heart. But out of the gate, I will admit that in hindsight, that I completely underestimated my adversary. Now if you're wondering why I would go through all this trouble, we need to go back eight weeks ago when I found myself stuck at home and very bored. So I installed a bird feeder and decided to become a bird watcher. And it was just so lovely. Until they showed up. Now luckily my bird feeder had a wire cage around it big enough for the birds to slip inside, but small enough to prevent the squirrels from getting the food. And that worked really well until right here. For me, this was like the moment in Jurassic Park when they realized the velociraptors can open door handles. And once the door was open, it was clear this wasn't their first rodeo. They basically cleared this whole tube of bird seed by the end of the day. Mind you, this bird feeder was advertised as being squirrel proof, so I bought another squirrel proof bird feeder to replace it. It's got this outer cage suspended by some springs, and so if a bird comes and lands here, it doesn't weigh that much and it has access to the seeds. However, if a squirrel comes, they'll grab onto this cage, its weight will force the springs down, thereby preventing access to the seeds. I have no idea how the squirrels could possibly outsmart this, but let's see. And this one worked exactly as intended. You can see the birds love it, but when the squirrel comes along, the cage shifts down and now all the seed ports are covered up. Every time they tried, it was the same results. However, the next morning, this guy manages to unclip the springs that hold the cage up, which means the cage stays in the lowered position where it blocks all the seed openings. Problem with that is now they can get to the lid. But this bird feeder lid doesn't hinge open to give direct access. So he goes with a different tactic. where he now has access to all the bird seed he wants. And so I decided I would try one more bird feeder design. Okay, wow. It almost feels intentional at this point. This one's supposed to work well because it's got this baffle, which is supposed to keep the squirrels from just coming straight down and getting to the seeds. And more importantly, there's no way for them to rip this off. We'll see. This one debuted to similar results. As he hangs by a few toes, this is when I really started to gain an appreciation for what they were capable of. It definitely seemed like this bird feeder was their favorite. Okay. Yeah, they're flexing on me for sure. And at this point, a plan was forming in my head, but just to be thorough, I moved the post away from the fence and I can't say I was surprised when they just climbed it. Nor was I surprised to see they could shimmy up and down a small metal pole, or even a large one for that matter. And whether they could climb a certain pole material was a moot point anyways because of this. Look at this! These guys are basically freaking rodent-sized Simone Bile. And so after a couple weeks of brainstorming, designing, and building with my buddy John, we put it all together in this 20 second build montage. Here are the basic elements. For starters, here's where I've placed their favorite bird feeder, at the end of the course. And to sweeten the deal, right below that, there's a trap door. And if they step here, it releases a butt ton of walnuts and unfurls some celebratory banners. Why walnuts? I'm glad you asked. I'm using walnuts because over the course of a week, I put out a buffet of seven different nuts and seeds. And all four times I repeated the experiment, walnuts were always the one they ate first. What's great about placing this here is it levels the playing field as the birds can fly up and get as much food as they want anytime they need it. The squirrels, however, will have to work for it because the only way to make it to this platform is if they work their way through my eight part Ninja Warrior obstacle course, which all starts right here. This is the only platform on the course that has a pole that isn't covered in slippery stuff, which means this is where they have to climb up 
to enter the course. If they try and get up any other way, they can't keep a good grip, and they just slide back down. So the first challenge is the bridge of instability. Now this may look easy, but the trick is it attaches at a single point on each end. And from a physics standpoint, that makes it no different than trying to crawl across a tightrope. It's next up, the maze of a thousand corridors. This one's a bit more cerebral, but if they make it through that, it will bring them to the pitchfork tumblers, which are inspired by the show Wipeout. But unlike Wipeout, I should point out that all these contraptions are squirrel friendly. And even with a little back force, they will break away and stop spinning. Now if they can make it past the pitchfork tumblers of treachery, they come to one of my personal favorites, the home wrecker. I put her in to tempt the squirrel to lose focus on the real prize at the end of the course. Because this pad has a pressure sensor underneath it, and it connects to a microcontroller that has a relay that connects to a solenoid that connects to a pneumatic piston that connects back to this platform with the pressure sensor. And so if they stand here for more than three seconds, They've got to start the course all over again. Next up is the Sneaky Bridge of Deception. I've suspended a juicy walnut right in the middle, but there's no way this bridge will support their weight, so it'll be interesting to see how they approach it. The sixth challenge is called the Tourist Trap. It's actually a bit of a reward for making it this far. If the squirrel sticks their head through this board my wife painted, it's just a photo op they can hang on the wall of their tiny squirrel nest. I'll place a walnut here as an incentive for them not to miss this unique opportunity. The penultimate challenge are the quad steps of great elevation. This is taken straight from Ninja Warrior, and this is super tricky because these pads are all totally smooth and placed at a 45 degree incline. And now for the last challenge. At this point, they are a mere few feet away from their ultimate goal, but if they're not careful, they'll have to deal with the orbital assist platform, AKA the final countdown, AKA it's not a catapult, it's a squirrelapult. Which means they now have to go back and start all the way over from the beginning. Now, if they wanna avoid that fate, they just need to stand on this pad for less than three seconds, but once they want. And so after nearly a month of prep work, the course was officially open for business. They could smell the walnuts at the final station, and you could see the gears turning because right above that was their favorite bird feeder. And so before long, we had our first contender. exactly go as planned, so Rick decides to regroup. Speaking of which, that's Rick. There are a total of four competitors that will be attempting the course. First vendors, let's get back to Rick. So he hops back on and he's actually doing better than his first attempt. Just barely. This is the best because he's like, okay, I got this. Never mind. Well, maybe I- No, I definitely don't. And this was the exact moment I realized I just might be outmatched here. Marty was watching Rick, and after a quick dip of his toes in the water, adopts his strategy right out of the gate. Oof, so close. But an excellent recovery. In fact, Gus, perhaps predictably, comes up a little short. Which brings us to the maze of a thousand corridors. Which, to be honest, they mastered this one pretty quickly. Here's a solid run from Fat Gus. And now for the pitchfork tumblers of treachery. Marty was like, yeah, that's a hard pass. Bad Gus is just like, abort! Frank is just like, mm, nope. Then he's like, wait a second, mm, still nope. Then Marty flies in real hot over the top. He didn't make it through, but that's partial credit as far as I'm concerned. And then here's Fat Gus with my favorite attempt by far. And then Frank shows no fear, which helps him pull up this near flawless run. And finally, Smart Rick surgically weaves his way through, essentially untouched. And I should mention, the squirrels were most active from 6 to 10 a.m. So every morning, I've been getting up before the sunrise to start filming from in my house like one of those camouflage nature photographers. Now back to the course where even Smart Rick eventually lets his guard down, which is exactly when she strikes. But just like all the other obstacles so far, after a day or two, they'd mastered it. In this case, even disregarding her offering of a fresh walnut. Now onto the slinky bridge of deception. And this was the sleeper obstacle in my book. That is not a large gap, which they can easily jump, but having the slinky there just threw them off somehow. You can see how much Frank is struggling here, and he's the brave one. 
And Rick only jumps when Marty shows up for emotional support. But like all the obstacles so far, after a day or two they'd mastered it. Now onto our third to last obstacle, the tourist trap. And this one was just a freaking delight. A little peanut butter really did the trick here. Frank comes in rather confident, almost to his demise, but he pulls off the smooth recovery. So after not much time at all, they were looking pretty good here. In fact, one morning I noticed Marty totally skipped the last step altogether, which I took as a challenge, and so I removed the middle step to see what they would do. And Smart Rick was the first one to enter the course, so in the end, after about a week of effort, it was fitting he was the one to make it to the jackpot first. And he's so stoked, he apparently wants to run the whole course in reverse. In hindsight, we probably should have made the jackpot a little quieter. Here's Marty, as always, not far behind. He's also a bit flighty, as you know, which worked against him here, because down below Fantastic Gus, ever the opportunist, comes through with a real stroke of brilliance. But pretty soon Marty comes back like, um, I'm the one who kinda earned that. And then Fantastic Gus is like, you snoozy loose sucker! And might I just say, Fantastic Gus, when you sit like that, you don't look an ounce over 700 grams. But of all the animals, I can definitively say now that squirrels are my absolute favorite. And they're certainly a more formidable adversary than porch pirates. They're kind of adorable, incredibly crafty, curious by nature, athletic, and persistent. Turns out squirrels can live to be 20 years old, and so I like to think that someday, Fantastic Gus will bring his grand squirrels to the fence and regale them with tales of cowboys and courage and legendary walnut piles.